Everyone's got some furniture that doesn't quite fit their room. You bought it, you thought it would work, it's not quite right. What if I told you you could sell that, find a better piece, and not pay full retail? It's here and it's called App Deco. They're the next managed marketplace for used furniture, and it's my favorite way software can create brand new behaviors in the same way that Instacart let you get your groceries or Uber made it easier to get around. It's a $14 billion market that can only get bigger because this is new supply and new demand that didn't exist before. This team is a case study in being data-driven, doing unscalable things, and then scaling them in one of the world's biggest possible markets. Let's get started. Wow, thank you guys for showing up on my YouTube channel. I really appreciate your time and attention here. I guess to start off with, what is AppDeco and how did you guys get started? Why did you start working on this? So AppDeco is a marketplace for buying and selling furniture based out of uh, New York City. We actually started out of our own frustrations. I was finishing business school and had a rough experience trying to sell my furniture on Craigslist and and ultimately thought to ourselves that there could be a better way to do this. Column also had a kind of similar experience as well. So what we built is a managed marketplace where people can list and sell their furniture, buy it all through the platform. And we also have a fully integrated delivery service as well. And we built a lot of logistics software in the back end to support it. Yeah. The long and the short is we kind of said three things to ourselves. If you can make a platform for trusted users, if you can make the payment exchange easy for the two parties. And if you can facilitate the pickup and the delivery that you can make something really useful for people. That was the, the main things that we looked at. We took inspiration from Airbnb and then looked at the market and saw it was a, this is a huge, huge market. Um, and we thought that we could make something useful for people. One of those huge markets that is sort of lying in plain sight. I mean, people spend a lot of money on furniture. You've always really focused on specifically the kind of furniture that people really like to have, they really love, actually. It's the specific brands that they're looking at anyway. And I had one of your customers recently tell me that there's really never a reason to go directly to some of the brands that we're talking about and buy new when you can get something that is as good, but used for an outrageously much reduced price, basically the same quality and actually even easier because it just appears on your doorstep or appears directly in the room that you need the furniture in. Exactly. We didn't know that at the beginning, our customers and our data told us that. We saw that 70% of our sales were coming from uh, seven brands that people love, you know, where West Elm, Ikea, Restoration Hardware, CB2, Crate and Barrel, Pottery Barn. Our focus was, well, let's give people what they want. <laughs> and these are the brands that people want. And we started to think about the merchandising and the website to feature these things, you know, working, incentivizing sellers to also list this particular type of inventory. We sell lots of different types of brands, lots of things, vintage items. That was a huge focus of ours and being able to highlight it and feature these items and feature these brands to attract customers was something that from a marketing perspective was a big focus too. I mean, that's something that we're seeing across basically the whole initialized portfolio, but also I think YC has seen this too, that managed marketplaces that make things so much basically better, faster, cheaper. I mean, this is fundamentally better, faster, cheaper than both buying new at retail and trying to do the crapshoot that is uh, Craigslist or Facebook marketplace. Whenever you can basically match buyers and sellers in exactly this way you're actually bringing on a whole bunch of new behavior and then you're making new transactions that basically would have been sort of lost to probably waste. 80% of furniture goes to landfill and these are actually big ticket items. I mean, these are tables and chairs that are worth thousands of dollars when you're talking restoration hardware. And it's sort of mind blowing that rather than brave Craigslist or Facebook marketplace, a lot of people just sort of throw it in the garbage. You have to have something from a business perspective that's useful and viable. And I think with that in concert with really making a strong and, and significant sustainability impact, we feel is a, a secret sauce to make something really successful. In the beginning, we actually did not 
really think about the sustainability factor. But as we looked at the data, it really became apparent that there is a lot of furniture that ends up in landfills and, and AppDeco really solves that problem. To date, um, we've been able to offset around 9 million CO2, carbon dioxide pounds uh, from essentially going to landfills, which is something that we're very, very proud of. I've been really amazed at watching you achieve product market fit in this managed marketplace model because it doesn't come easy. You know, it wasn't easy to do to create something that has so much demand at this point. That's probably something that a lot of marketplace founders actually struggle with. How did you approach the demand side in terms of repeatable customer acquisition? I think that we have been really focused on having a diversified set of acquisition channels, whether it's out of home, whether it's doing subway advertising or Facebook, Instagram, Google, any of these type of channels. But then the more important part was really speaking toward speaking to the service and the convenience that we provide, particularly on the, as well as the brands that we're offering as well, really being able to figure out how to speak to those things in a way where someone can understand what we're doing in, in a couple of seconds has been a huge focus. The other thing I would add to that is it's also the service that we're providing really helps on the demand side. By owning our own logistics, we're actually able to pass cost savings down to customers in terms of the cost for delivery. So uh, users want to use this because we offer this delivery service that's affordable, but also amazing. And that really helps generate that demand and, and builds that word of mouth that uh, we've seen in our business. It's really what propelled us to grow as fast as we are, as we're growing. Nobody wants to put that bed together or <laughs> assemble exactly. it. And so having that <laughs> white glove service where they're just like, put it there and set it up there uh, was a huge differentiator. It was a harder way to go for sure, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the things I was really impressed by Kalam, what you were doing, especially on the sort of Facebook ad and ad copy side, it was really interesting to see early on. That was something that you relied on outside vendors initially and then later discovered, hey, this is something that as, as a founder, you're actually very uniquely positioned to write the message. We tried to outsource that and then realized it was unsuccessful. And then we went back and took a second look at it and took control of the creative messaging and under, really started to learn about our, our voice and really learning about what connects to what our buyers and what our customers connected to through making sure that our creatives are fresh, different, interesting. When we started to really invest in that in terms of our time, our energy, uh, and our focus, it, it made all the difference in the world. Raham, to your point about making the service that much out of the box, way better. I mean, to be able to just go online, buy something, have it be the same product, but a way better price, and then have it actually be delivered all the way to your door to to actually to the room that required just an incredible focus on logistics and delivery. I mean, what were sort of the things you learned along the way as you were building that? Oh my gosh. Well, it definitely, it definitely wasn't easy, but, uh, uh, yeah. it didn't start out that way either in terms of, yeah, we started off actually outsourcing delivery as well. So our whole notion was, can we slot into moving companies access capacity and, and do deliveries that way. But we found that the quality of service wasn't there. And at the end of the day, it impacts our brand. When something goes wrong, they're not blaming the delivery company, they're blaming AppDeco, they as in the customers. Um, so that's quickly how we brought it in-house. The least amount of, the, the lower the amount of times that you touch the furniture, the better it is from a cost perspective. But obviously then this makes the logistics side of things hard because you're picking up and delivering on the same day. So we have to think about the scheduling aspect of things. How do you match buyers and sellers to the same day? How do you deliver an item within a very short period of win a short window? Uh, these are the things that we've learned and we've built a lot of tech to support that. Very, very proud of what we've been able to build. And it's really a testament, you know, our, our reviews speak to it. Our customers are always amazed about the delivery service that we're able to provide. Yeah. From an intellectual property perspective, that's where it's really all about the logistics, routing and scheduling is are the things that we've built that are really unique, powerful. And it's why a lot of other companies have been, they've wanted to utilize our delivery services. We started out trying to out, you know, outsource it. And now we have people looking to utilize ours because of the way we've been able to do it so efficiently. Yeah. Software is an incredible multiplier here. It's a lot of people do logistics still with 
Excel spreadsheet. And maybe the state of the art is now, instead of using Excel, they're using Airtable. But what you guys have built is a world-class logistics software platform that holds its own. And in a space that actually enables no warehousing, which I think is like one of the more interesting discoveries you made that frankly killed many a competitor that Rather than solving the harder problem, which is how do you get same day pickup and delivery to work, they said, well, we'll just, we'll just have warehouses. That leads to a sort of explosion in cost, actually. I think the premise there also for a lot of these companies was people just want to get rid of that furniture and they're willing to get rid of it for nothing. Where what we're learning is, especially if you want to focus on those top brands that Colin mentioned earlier, people care. They build a relationship with these furniture pieces and they want to pass them on to people that care about them and they care about how much they're getting for them. Uh, so that premise of just, hey, we'll just get it off of my hands for like no cost is actually a very small percentage of the market. The majority of the market, people care about, about these furniture pieces and they want to make money for them. And this is what we're able to offer here at Afdaco. Yeah. The other thing too, is that it just really limits when you're talking about this warehouse option, there's this cost perspective, but cost, lack of efficiency, but you're really capped by what you can store and hold. Your marketplace is literally is capped by what you can store and hold. And this allows for us to have a really diversified set of products. And it's produced a really interesting and very customer base that comes to the platform because we have lots of things and we, and we, we're not capped by that. And instead we're focusing on Let's have this item sell in less than a week. That is what we're, that's the service that we're providing to sellers that they know that they don't have to have this item stored in their home because of the way that we are merchandising the, the items on the site and doing effective marketing to help them find buyers. And that's the service that we're providing. I think that's what I've been really impressed by working with you. Obviously, Initialize has been an investor. Has We've just seen you reach product market fit. Very large market. It's a managed marketplace even talking through this, like you've solved the demand side and then you've actually helped through your logistics, you've actually double solved it. You know, not only did you figure out how to sustainably get customers, but you also made the service so compelling that it became a virtuous cycle. It's very rare to run across a marketplace startup where you are supply constrained instead of demand constrained. It's very rare to be supply constrained as a startup founder, how did you deal with that, that realization? What have you done since? Once that realization set in, in terms of being supply constrained, it really opened up our focus to look for these power sellers, power sellers to provide that supply. And there, we realized there are lots of different types of businesses that type of inventory that we're looking for and figuring out how to source that inventory has been a huge area of focus and a way for us to really scale the business. And it's been a big focus of the last year or two that's been quite successful. The other thing too is really talking with, we have a lot of people who are buying on the platform. We also are looking at making those buyers into sellers, sellers into buyers. And that's been a huge focus of ours as well in terms of having both people on the platform, utilizing both sides. One of the things that uh, all of us have been talking a lot about, especially in the past year has been, uh, how do we increase our thoughtfulness around building diverse teams? You guys have been incredibly intentional about this, this, you know, at initialized, we use the Rooney rule in terms of, you know, making sure that every role that we hire for half of the candidates at the interview level are from underrepresented minorities or women. And that, that's something I think is very needed in uh, VC and in tech. How do you guys think about it? I think by virtue of being diverse founders, this is something that's been very natural for us. And it's something that we have been focused on, Act frankly, from day one is hiring diverse teams because we've always believed that diversity of thought that comes from, you know, backgrounds or, you know, all kinds of sort of diversity really helps propel your company to be as successful as possible. The way we've thought about it is going outside of sort of the normal channels. So instead of hiring from like the Ivy Leagues, going to other type of schools, or you can go to startups or go to, you know, hire from startups or also hire from traditional companies that may, uh, you kind of have like find those, those folks that are stars in those companies that you might have not heard about before. So it's something that we've really uh, focused on and, um, and we we're very proud of our, of our team makeup. It's, uh, it's as diverse as it gets. I wish I could show you our Google our, our morning Zoom, our morning call. Zoom calls are just uh, yeah. are, are as diverse as it can get. So something yeah. I'm very proud of. 
The other thing too is that you know there were times where we were just like, we're hiring a woman for this position, mm -hmm. just straight up, and we're not. When we saw things, maybe we were getting really we were, like maybe we're missing representation um, at a more senior level. We were very intentional, very purposeful, just ex specific about it, and we didn't make any qualms about that. And I think that's been really it's been really helpful. Sometimes it'll take longer to be honest with you, but you know because you don't want to sacrifice on terms of finding the ideal candidate. But in the end, we think we're better for it. We definitely have an intrinsic belief that diversity yields way better outcomes. And I think that's one of the biggest things that's challenging all of us in tech is that if uh, the people who create the tech are not representative of the people who use it, people making the tech sometimes don't make the thing that meets the needs of the people actually. And that, that's a real problem. So we really believe in encouraging all of our portfolio companies to think about it and have it be a part of their process. And we thank you for your leadership here. Braham and I come from corporate backgrounds and have had experience with hiring, firing, managing people, just managing people. And I think a lot, I think that's one Achilles Hill of a lot of startup founders is maybe you don't have that level of experience. And so for us, you know, the one thing I think is always important to encourage is just to not be afraid of having a dialogue mm -hmm. to, it doesn't matter not to, not to be afraid to talk about things. I think that that's served us well too, is, is really not being afraid of having conversations around whatever, for that matter, you know, really promoting open dialogue has made a big difference in terms of talking about whatever topic, anything that's there. I mean, but specifically around diversity as well. So, yeah. you know, when we're speaking whatever role, you know, like, Hey, like we really want diversity in this company. Like let's, what does that look like? So we have those intentional conversations among the team as well. So it comes from us, but also everybody in the team believes in it, even if they maybe have not, when they joined, that's what they thought, but now they really do believe in it and they execute based on that as well. Yeah. Actually, it's been interesting to see even internal to initialize. We've actually, we try and run sometimes anonymous surveys so that anyone at any level of the org can talk about things related to diversity or how our, in terms of our hiring, in terms of our strategies around that. One of the interesting things that have, has come up is that unless the leadership comes out and makes it safe to talk about it, sort of this worry that what if someone says the wrong thing, I think it does, it requires leadership from top down within every organization to, to normalize uh, that type of dialogue. One of the things that a lot of people watching this are early in their careers, they see a, an amazing number of uh, both high school students and college students who are watching the YouTube channel at this point. What are some of the things that you felt like you learned the hard way, you know, when you were 18 or 22, just deciding to come into the workforce, maybe not even knowing that you wanted to work in tech yet? For each of you, I'm, I'm curious, like what was sort of a Hard lesson one. I mean, I think for me, starting a business, I thought I need to have a lot of experience in business, whatever that means. The learning here is, you know, I think even especially for college students or uh, fresh grads, like if you have an idea, it's actually a good time to start it even when you're in college and when you're fresh out of college and you don't have to wait to get a lot of experience to get there. You can hire people around you who have more experience than you that can help you and challenge you. Um, would be better, but you don't necessarily need that. Of course, there's pros and cons to both sides, but it's something, it took me a long time to realize that I'm ready to start a business before we started it. To kind of give you that license. Exactly. Give yourself yeah. that license to do it. Like, <laughs> the, the permission slip, yeah, exactly. no one's going to exactly. write it for you. Exactly. You just have to write it and just give it to yourself. And then you're like, I got it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think for me, it's, um, I think what's been the most fascinating thing is the, just the process of figuring things out is such a really enlightening and fascinating process. Quite frankly, like through, through Y Combinator, I think the biggest thing that we took away is, is just the scrappy nature of what, of, of just getting those first customers, uh, and how you, uh, have to really avail yourself to understanding doing something that's completely unscalable and then taking the learnings to figure out how to make this into something that that's really a, a large and could be something on a large and really scalable process. That whole journey has been one of the most fascinating things for that, that I've learned, especially coming from that is not applied in, in corporate America, but in startups, that is, that's how you do it. And that's been such a wonderful and exciting thing to learn. Yeah. I mean, I've seen you guys do this multiple times now, even in the things we talked about earlier. I mean, the first step was 
getting demand and you did it how a lot of people do it, which is, well, I, I don't know how to buy Facebook ads yet, but I'm going to find people who look like they can. And then it's okay to use third parties off the bat. And that's where a lot of startups, they sort of like stay there forever, but then they never turn that into a strength. What I really like what you did here was do the unscalable thing, I guess, you know, do the thing that gets you off the ground, but then ask questions about, well, how is that copy doing? And what is the convert rate? And oh, the last set of copy that they used, that doesn't quite explain exactly what is new or different about us. And so we need to take this in house. We're going to do it ourselves. And so that you've done it multiple times in a row now. I mean, Rahan, when you were talking about the logistics side, you start off buying the time of moving companies. You know, movers already have trucks, they already have people. So can you just slot it in there? But as you did it, you asked the questions, which is, how is it for our customers? And is it cost effective? Is it an experience that we can put our stamp behind? And when the answer was no, you said, we're going to do the harder thing. We're going to do the more unusual thing. But then that actually builds the business. I love that you're here because this is sort of the, the building blocks of making a very special managed marketplace in one of the world's largest markets. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's like, if you, well, I was going to say, if you've seen, if you see column spreadsheets now about, around campaigns, they're <laughs> pretty insane. We really, uh, very data-driven company, and it, it took us a long time to get to this point, but it's, but it's really what's propelling us to to be, you know, successful and and grow our business the way we do. And I to your question even around what are the things that you kind of learn or wish you knew or learned earlier on is around the data aspect and the importance of really using your data. Of course, you do unscalables in the beginning. Um, we've passed out flyers. We've reached out to people on crisis. We've done so many unscalables, but at some point you take that information and data and convert it into useful tools to help you build the scalable things. And, and that's something that we continue to do here. And it's just so important, I think, for people starting off. It's just don't wait too long to collect that data. The data is very important. I think the other thing too, just, I know we're going on a little, a little here, but it's just, I think one thing that's important is the one thing that we, as you were talking through this, Gary, is you're talking about the learnings of, of being a founder is just being hell bent on finding the solution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it, it's the smartest solution. It doesn't mean it's the easiest solution, but you just hell bent on finding the solution. And that's the consistent thing across all of these things. You know, when we were to your point with this, with these movement companies. It's like, what is the best solution and surveying the field in terms of what those things can be. Looking at those campaigns, like you see 15 campaigns, none of them work. You see one that works and looking at that data and digging deeper, but it's always focused on the solutions, trying to get you to where you need to be uh, is something that's crucial, mm -hmm. crucial. You've been able to do it in grand fashion in so many different ways, again, in like one of the more astonishingly large markets that is still untapped. Fellow YC and initialized company Goat has been, they've built the next billion dollar managed marketplace. They did it in very similar fashion to how you've done it, asking the right questions, doing the unscalable and then scaling them. But the coolest thing about furniture is like the ticket size is 10x bigger on your average order size. You're also in one market, right? So, and you're about to expand into many more markets. So this is a really exciting time for AppDeco. Yeah, we're, we're very excited. Um, it's, uh, it's been an amazing journey and uh, excited to see where it's headed for sure. Definitely excited about the months to come. And, and I think we're just, we've learned a lot and it's really just about taking those learnings, continuing to apply them. You know, we couldn't be more excited about that and really having amazing partners. It's just true, you know, having amazing partners along that journey. You, you know, you guys have been wonderful partners for us. It's just the truth. It just makes the journey a lot more exciting and just gives us a lot of confidence in terms of where we're going. For people watching, if you are in the uh, New York metropolitan area, App Deco works for you right now. A couch or uh, you know, dining table or office desk that you've been meaning to switch out with something better, you can both buy way better stuff on App Deco and you can get rid of your old stuff, <laughs> especially if it's one of those top brands, because what's old to you might be very new to someone else. And that's the makings of an awesome market. And so it sounds like there's a style quiz on appdeco.com to check out. Absolutely. That's the best way to get started.
Yeah, you know, awesome. Southwest help you, and we can provide great recommendations in terms of what you what you potentially would want. And obviously, selling on the platform is super easy, and and we would encourage anybody just to give it a shot. We're very we're excited about the experience that we're providing for people. And then you're also hiring. It sounds like engineers, marketing, even a head of people. That's what product market fit looks like: is trying to build the org to keep on top of demand. Yes, so definitely hiring. So appdeco.com <laughs> slash careers, please. Yeah, yeah we're definitely up. excited to meet new people. So definitely feel free to apply. Yeah, and then are you looking for people in uh, New York City or open to remote for some hires? We are definitely open to, for remote for some hires. Anywhere in the US, I think is right now fair game. This is the new world we're living in. Definitely. <laughs> it's all virtual. Yeah, well, knock on wood. It, We'll have a nice hybrid office plus remote sort of life in another six to nine months. We'll see. Thank you guys so much for coming on the channel. I, I always learn a lot from hanging out with you guys. And it's just credit to you for building a product that people absolutely love and uh, coming to a metropolitan area near you. Very soon. Very soon. Yeah. Thanks so much for having yeah, us, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. Appreciate it.